As we celebrate Pride and the progress we've made over these past years, there's still work to be done. So to those of you out there who are still working against equal rights, we have a message for you. You think we're sinful? You fight against our rights? You say we all lead lives you can't respect? But you're just frightened? You think that we'll corrupt your kids if our agenda goes unchecked? Funny, just this once, you're correct. We'll convert your children. Happens bit by bit, quietly and subtly, and you will barely notice it. You can keep them from disco, warn about San Francisco. Make him wear pleated pants, we don't care. We'll convert your children. We'll make them tolerant and fair. At first I didn't get why you'd be so scared of us turning your children into accepting, caring people, but I see now why you'd have a problem with that. Just like you worried, they'll change their group of friends. You won't approve of where they go at night. To protest, oh, and you'll be disgusted. So gross. When they start finding things online that you've kept far from their sight, like information. Guess what? You'll, you'll still, still be, be alright. Right. We'll convert your children. Yes, we will. Reaching one and all, there is really no escaping it. Cause even Grandma likes RuPaul, and the world's getting kinder. Gen Z's gayer than grinder. Learn to love, learn to vogue, face your fate. We'll convert your children. Someone's gotta teach them not to hate. We're coming for them. We're coming for your children. What you just heard and saw might be familiar to you. It's the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus from 2021. We covered it on the show when it came out. <clears throat> Welcome to Disaffected. I'm Joshua Slocum, and I'm coming to you, not live, but recorded from Burlingtonica. Why, what is that? Burlington and Ithaca, New York are the same city, and I'm out of town, which is why you see a different background I'm at my sister's house. Don't worry, she's incredibly based. So I drove into Ithaca, which is exactly the same city as Burlington. Both of them are, are small um, versions of Seattle. 
I was immediately treated to, of course, the queer flag, the BLM signs, and my favorite. In this house, we believe that women's rights are human rights, that science is real. And I'm in the car with my sister. I'm like, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. <laughs> Uh, the gay men's chorus from San Francisco would fit in so well right here in this little beautiful pocket of upstate western New York. So we'll convert your children. That was just a joke, right? It was joking. Joking. Remember, head tilt means you can get away with anything. Just joking. You know, we were just, you know, making fun of like all those terrible things that straight people said about us. <laughs> no. That wasn't a joke. Does that little psychopath look like he's joking to you? Look at him. Mm-hmm. Those are psychopath eyes. Reminds me of that, that shot of Anthony Perkins at the end of Psycho. Uh-huh. Yeah. And a number of them, according to some researchers, I wasn't able to verify this, but it looked plausible to me what I did see. A number of the men you saw in that, uh, uh, like Brady Bunch uh, cubed or to the power of four uh, grid, sex offender records. Mm. Surprise, surprise. So many of the things that the horrible fundamentalist Christian right as I used to call them. So many of the things that they said in the 1980s would happen, have happened. That's a very bitter pill to swallow for homosexuals. I was gonna say of a certain age like mine, but it's apparently a difficult pill to swallow for homosexuals of any age. They were right that this was the first step in a slippery slope. I don't like that they were right. I, I would prefer emotionally to satisfy my own personal desires, I would prefer that they be wrong. But my preferences have nothing to do with reality. And they were right. We have devolved into an absolute lecherous, lewd bacchanal. And, and I'm not just saying that because of an offended sense of propriety. Remember, I used to be one of these people. Right? Um, I understand, sadly, how these modern activists who consider themselves sexual minorities, I understand how they feel because in my era, in my context, I was one of them. I participated in queering the culture. You think that's new? It isn't. Way back when I was in college from 95 to 99, we were already reading books in anthropology class like Fear of a Queer Planet, which was a collection of essays written by post-structuralist, deconstructionist, um, continental uh, philosophy, Foucault, Derrida, the rest of them. We thought, I thought, that normality, is it normality or normalcy? Is it? Normalcy. It's, my sister says it's normalcy. Um, whatever. <laughs> I thought that normal sex was poison. Normal families were oppressive. Heteronormativity, keeping things to yourself in your bedroom and having boundaries between public and private was all just super oppressive. It was all just going against our nature. Well, that was my brainwashing talking, and it was also my background of child abuse and trauma talking. Um, I should have known better, and a lot of us should have known better. AIDS should have taught me better and the rest of us. I was alive at the tail end of the AIDS crisis. I watched people die, people I knew, friends. And like many of the activists, I was mad at the government for not finding a cure quickly enough. Safety me harder, daddy. You know what? It wasn't the government that did this to gay men. It wasn't an, a cold and unfeeling medical establishment that did AIDS to gay men. Gay men did AIDS to ourselves. We sexed our way into an epidemic that killed thousands of us. This was 100% 
our choice and our responsibility and 0% anyone else's oppression. You know, I was listening to the Matt Walsh show last week and he had a clip, I should have pulled it for you, about it uh, from an activist gay doctor who said, I, I'm sorry, he did speak in the voice because he's a stereotype. In all the years that I've been working with um, with men who have sex with men, and blah, 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 I have never seen a case of HIV AIDS transmission that was not from stigma. So we really have to get rid of the stigma because stigma is a stigma, is a stigma, stigma death. What does that mean? I've never seen a single case of HIV transmission that wasn't from stigma. Is that what they're calling it now? Because there were more colorful and direct terms for that in my day. Stigma, that's taking it raw dog. That's what causes AIDS, not stigma. It's spreading your legs indiscriminately. It's being a slut that causes you to get sick. <laughs> we gays did this to ourselves. We caused our own deaths. And then we wanted to blame the government for not coming up with the treatment quickly enough for us. Well, here we are today. Take a look at this tweet from Colin Rugg. He says, it's, it's structured in the, um, uh, as a dialogue. So the right, the right of the political sphere says, quote, the LGBTQ mob is coming for your children. Then the left says, you're making it all up. That's a conspiracy theory. Here comes an LGBTQ parade from last week. We're here, we're queer and coming for your children. Roll it, Kevin. <laughs> Give me more of those fat tribal beats. We're here. Tick, 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 tick. Shut up. Stop waggling your tits around. She had, look, I'm sorry, but look at all those young white women. How did we not know how many young perverted white women there were until this past few years? What are they doing? These people are not righteous activists. They are child groomers. They're pedophiles or they are sympathizers to pedophiles. Some of them are evil. Some of these people are essentially evil. They're not misguided. They're evil. They're unreformable. The hard cases here, the real leaders, the ones everybody flocks around, the ones with a lot of charisma, they're personality disorder. They're cluster B. There's some mix of borderline, histrionic, narcissistic, sociopathic. But many of them are not. Most of them are not. There's going to be a higher percentage. You take any group of people like you're seeing on your screen right there, you pick out 100 of them. Instead of there being maybe 5 to 10% of them with a personality disorder, which I think is, is probably the case with the background population, there's going to be like 25, 30, maybe 40%. But it still isn't the majority. There are a lot of people who are absolutely brainwashed and they're going along with this. And I was one of those people. I would have been in this march had it taken place 30 years ago. Unfortunately, I understand this mindset, perhaps fortunately, actually, because I can talk, I can talk to people about it having been on both sides of this fence. The brainwashing is so deep. When you come from a home where you are actually abused the way I was and the way most homosexuals do, it's most. It is. You know, this minority stress hypothesis, the reason why gay people have an extraordinarily high rate of addictions, mental illnesses, and personality disorders, and they do, it's in the literature, um, go argue with the facts. Researchers, clinicians, and of course, gay people themselves like to blame it on the minority stress. They don't necessarily know the term, but the minority stress hypothesis is that life is so difficult for you if you're a minority. There's so much stigma. There's so much active discrimination that it unbalances you. Um, and of course, if you are abused daily, if you are the victim of actual discrimination, it is going to mentally derange you to some degree. It's going to turn you into a different person. That's real. We all know that. That's not what's going on here. Gay people and 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 the rest of these so-called queers they're not oppressed they're at the top of the totem pole they are at the very top of the american cultural food chain 
Our traumas and the reasons why we're so susceptible to this have to do with our families of origin and not just because they kicked us out because we were gay and everything was wonderful and lovely until I was 14 years old. And then all of a sudden, my mom and dad hated me just because of that. That happens sometimes, but it isn't most of the time because there is also a correlation between early child abuse, that is pre-sexuality, and ending up homosexual. Ding. Yeah, I know. Everyone hates it. It's true. How can we get... What happens is that you, when if you are like me, and there are many people like me, you displace your trauma from home onto something else, you externalize it. So I decided, you know, when I was 12 or 13 years old and trying to kill myself, I decided that the reason why I was as screwed up mentally as I was, was because I was picked on at school for being gay. It was because the world didn't understand gay people. It was all homophobic abuse that made me that way. That is not true. Long before I had any sexual thoughts, child abuse was a reality in my everyday home. But I transferred it. I projected it onto something else. And gay people do this all the time. This is why I don't necessarily believe people when they say, oh, I had a wonderful childhood. My parents were just great. It, nothing happened until I went to school and then everybody bullied me and I became the way I am. Unlikely. How can we get more traumatized gays and, and, and normie religious people to understand each other? this way. I don't know, but it's on my mind. Let's move to a bit of viewer mail. This is in response to our ongoing discussion about new normal, bad service, blank zombie Stepford people behind, no, not even cash registers anymore. Zombie monitors to monitor the self checkouts to make sure that you are doing what the machines tell you to do. So this comes from a disaffected supporter in our discord how do you get to be a disaffected supporter? You sign up at disaffectedpod.substack.com or at subscribestar.com slash disaffected. Then you can talk to the hundreds of fabulous people who have already improved their lives enormously by being in our Discord. This is from Reaganomics Lamborghini. And he says, you're going to love this exchange with a young, over-promoted professor who, in a program leadership role, saw fit to query the meaning of the term manifest, a term I've used in my coursework for years. So then he does the exchange. So it's Reaganomics Lamborghini and his colleague. Reaganomics Lamborghini says, to make something manifest means to make visible or to make clear. It's well established in the English language and students have managed to cope with this wording over the years that I've used this lesson. Here's his colleague's response. That's fine if the students have been comfortable with it in the past. Our friend responds, thanks. Not descend to the lowest common denominator. I use lots of terms and concepts they may be unfamiliar with in my lectures too, which I guess is the whole point of receiving an education. <laughs> it's galling. It's got, listen to that. That may sound normal to you, but it shouldn't sound normal. This professor says, as long as the students are comfortable with it, he's actually telling this guy to dumb his vocabulary down that a three syllable word manifest might not be comfortable for the students. You want to know what's wrong with American education? That's what's wrong with American education. That's not education. As long as they're comfortable, I wouldn't want to challenge them by asking to learn a new thing. It's not like they're in college or anything, is it? Let's go a little closer to home with Vermont Attorney General Charity Clark. This is our state attorney general. Hi, Charity. I like to call her Charity. Hi, Charity. Hi. If you can't see her, she's an attractive blonde with a head tilt standing at a podium. Of course she is. She's our mommy general, not just our attorney general, our mommy general. And she gave us a history lesson for Pride Month. And here it is. She delivered it on Twitter, of course, which is America's premier university. Charity says, on this day in 1969, the New York Police Department raided the Stonewall Inn and violently cracked down on the gay community. Led by trans women of color, including Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, the community fought back. <laughs> yes, these are bracelets of feminine. And the reason you can't see them is they're invisible, just like my invisible jet. Don't question me. 
Charity went on. The Stonewall Uprising, which lasted for six days, sparked the modern gay rights movement in the U.S. Despite the LGBTQIA plus community's advancements in achieving civil rights in the years since, the queer community, and particularly trans people, are once again under attack. Ching, ching, ching. As Attorney General, I stand with the queer community today and every day, and I will never stop fighting for equality and justice for all. The queer community? Who are you calling queer, bitch? Oh, you don't like that? You don't like being called bitch? I don't like being called queer either. Who the fuck do you think you are, Miss Clark? How dare you? You're lucky I don't move from the B word to the next letter in the alphabet because it would be appropriate. People had lots to say about this, including our own Kevin Hurley, who said, this is a historical and demonstrably false information. The Stonewall riot was not led by trans women of color. Marsha P. Johnson was a drag queen. The Stonewall riots were led by gays and lesbians like Fred Sargent. So hundreds and hundreds of people took charity to task here. This is amazing. I have not seen this before on Twitter. I scrolled through hundreds of responses. I didn't count them up, but there were actually, there were more than I saw, but there were hundreds and every single one of them was against her. Every single one was correcting her, pointing her to sources of actual historical information. I've never seen that before on Twitter. Had I got logged in, had this happened a year ago or two years ago, certainly before Elon Musk took over, all the responses from people correcting her would have led to banned accounts and suspended accounts. Not a single response supported her, not one that I saw. Progress, I suppose. Fred Sargent had something to say about this. He said, neither, neither of those two men were there when the raid happened. I was. Don't say that we were led by drug-addled, homeless, mentally ill drag queens who pimped lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth. No historian has ever said what you're saying. Get off the internet and read an LGBT his, LGB history before giving such an uninformed opinion. Fred didn't stop there. The Vermont Attorney General also has a horrible relationship with the police. Recently, she took the side of a weapon-wielding drug user, a sickle saw, and had two Vermont State Police troopers charged after they used non-lethal force all because of uh, he says the scale. I don't know what that means. Like the perpetrator crawled on his own off a roof and fell. This is what our attorney general does. This is what Chittenden County State's attorney, the county version of the attorney general, Sarah George does. They will not lock up violent criminals, but they will educate all of us by calling us queer about our own history. When we come back from the break, we're gonna have a real education with Mr. Fred Sargent himself. Can't get enough of our love, baby? That's because you're not subscribed. Move that thumb over to the great big old subscribe button on your podcast app so you never miss an episode. We put out audio only exclusive content that you won't get on any other video platform, so make sure you subscribe today. Looking for a non woke place to put your money where your mouth is? Put it where my mouth is. Disaffected supporters get access to our private Discord chat server, backstage episode recording sessions, surprise guests, and more. And all it takes is $10 a month. You've got two options. Either Substack, visit us at disaffectedpod.substack.com, or go over to subscribestar.com slash disaffected. Remember, choose the $10 level or higher for Discord access. Welcome back. We're living in an era where history is being rewritten. I don't think there's been any era in which history has not been rewritten to some degree, but it is being rewritten visually, linguistically, symbolically, artistically, objectively, at a rate and with ease today that 
was never possible before. But it has been possible before. There's precedent for what we're going through. Take a look at this picture. Many of you will recognize this famous picture of Joseph Stalin. Uh, it looks like from the late 30s. You see him standing next to a canal, and you see that he's got a young colleague next to him. But there's another version of this picture where all of a sudden his young colleague is not standing next to him anymore because he was, I was going to say airbrushed out. Uh, but actually in those days, this took much more work than simply airbrushing uh, a photograph. It took much more work than moving a mouse around. You had to actually scrape silver gelatin off a negative and paint in what wasn't there and paint out what was there. But it was possible. Of course, now it's much, much easier. And there is no area, I don't think, where history is being rewritten more thoroughly than the history of the gay civil rights and the gay liberation movement of the late 20th century. Just notice this on Twitter this week. This picture that you see here is an original photograph from 1983 from Dublin, Ireland's first gay liberation march. I believe the person who put this up uh, called it the first pride march, but th this wasn't called pride back when it started. We're gonna get there. So what it says here, it's a picture of demonstrators. It's very 1983. We've got somebody rocking the Ramones look and a Joan Jett haircut. Stop violence against gays and women is one of the signs. The next sign says, the police aren't on your side either. And the third sign says, get your filthy laws off my body. So that's the original 1983 photograph. That photograph was not aesthetically pleasing or politically pleasing enough for what is today called uh, Dublin Pride. So the campaigning organization in Dublin, Ireland that does all things L, G, B, T, Q, I, A, plus, two, plus, plus, plus. So they altered it. Take a look. Gone is the sign that says the police aren't on your side either. And inserted is trans rights are human rights. This will pass under people's noses and most people will never know the difference. Because the purpose of all of this, and people have been trained, most people believe false history now about the gay liberation movement. They believe that there was such a thing as a trans person, and there wasn't. There were transvestites, that is cross-dressers. Everyone knew they were transvestites and cross-dressers. There were drag queens who didn't wanna be called transvestites. I'm not gonna get into the politics of that. And there were the occasional the, transsexual. The all, In those days, the only type I ever met was the so-called homosexual, transsexual, the extremely effeminate man, the very, very rare bird who went all the way through the surgery. Very, very rare. And there was no such identity as trans. The word transgender had not even been invented. But this is what they're doing now. And as we told you in the last segment, it goes all the way to the top. Vermont's Attorney General Charity Clark stands in solidarity with what she calls the queer community. And uh, do we have those? Yeah, let's get this. Let's get that back here before we introduce our guest. Go back to the tweet where she gave us a history lesson, a false history lesson. On this day in 1969, the NYPD raided the Stonewall Inn and violently cracked down, blah, blah, blah. We've been through this. Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, the trans women of color who launched the movement. Well, we have somebody with us here today who did at, in fact, in actual objective, objective, verifiable fact, helped start the gay liberation movement. Fred Sargent, welcome to Disaffected. Thank you for joining us. Good to be with you. Uh, I have one question first. Do you keep in touch with the BIPOC trans women of color who gave you the rights that you enjoy today? <laughs> Do you stay in touch with any of those heroines? Well, you know, it's they're imaginary, so it's kind of hard to keep in touch. Well, I know, but imagination is the foundation of fun. Come on, Fred. Yeah, well. I, for, for those of you out there who don't know who Fred Sargent is, he was one of the originals at the 1969 Stonewall riots that happened at the Stonewall Inn. 
the actual bar. Fred, just for people who've never met you or heard your story before, I know you've been asked the same thing for 50 years. Just please give us a 20, 30 second sketch of what happened that night and what you did. Well, it, uh, it's something that I've, I've, as you've mentioned, said many times. And uh, one of the things that happens to me is trans activists will take my words, uh, edit them, decontextualize them, and then say that I wasn't there. Um, oftentimes, they use a statement that clearly shows that I was there and that I was making a statement about the events that occurred. Uh, but they have no sense of irony and, and uh, usually escapes and what they've done to themselves. Uh, and if I could go back one second to that, that photo that you put up uh, from Dublin Pride, the, the yeah. organizers and the, peop the people who put that uh, uh, photo up uh, after receiving a mountain of criticism on Twitter and social media, uh, not only did they not fix it, but they took another photo from the early 20th century of uh, women's suffrage protesters, and they photoshopped that same sign onto the women's signs looking for the vote. And as though that was something that was on people's minds back in the 1920s. Uh, oh, so, so we understand from, from Dublin that uh, it was also BIPOC trans women of color who got women the vote in the UK? Precisely. See, they, they, this audience, this is this is what we've been saying. They don't care because they don't have to care. They have no incentive to care about their lying. They are rewarded for their lying. Unbelievable. Um, you, you having been there, you having been there at Stonewall, um, how do you respond to what Vermont Attorney General Charity Clark did with her Twitter history lesson? Let me actually, let me, I know how, I know how you're going to respond to that. Let me spice this up a little bit. Fred, thinking back over the 50 years or so that you have been involved with gay liberation, was there ever a point where you, where you imagined that something like this would happen? Did you ever think we'd get to the point where you would have prominent people in government and frankly, in the straight majority? who are literally erasing history and reconstructing it fictitiously. Did you anticipate this? Well, shortly before this month I did, but you're right. I hadn't anticipated that it would go quite as far as it has. Uh, as we came into Pride Month, I knew I'd be busy uh, using my account to, to uh, uh, verbalize the criticisms of the um, historical re revisionism and that I had to focus my efforts. You know, you can't you can't go out and swat down every trans activist who gets on Twitter and says something that is on its face untrue. So I, right. I focus my efforts on people in in positions of power or uh, politicians, and uh, concentrating on getting their tweets, their gratuitous tweets about LGB history ratioed, which if you're familiar with Twitter, it's where the uh, comments and retweets vastly outnumber the, the likes for the tweet. And and some of the more significant figures that I was was able to do this with was the mayor of Edmond, uh, Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, he said something similar to the attorney general, um, the former Greek finance minister, who again, said something similar. Uh, the, the, um, uh, there was a New York state senator just recently that I did the same thing again. In fact, he's still getting ratioed as we speak uh, for his tweet where he said, again, essentially the same thing. And uh, uh, one, one last one came in last night from a publisher of a um, LGBTQ plus, you know, um, salad uh, that said something of the same, but attacked me at the same time, uh, attacked me for things that I hadn't said and uh, cautioned me not to speak about things uh, that he considered to be his purview, uh, oh. which got the, res you know, the expected result from me. Yes, and the publisher is, is um, uh, 
a person who had been at Stonewall. His name is Mark Siegel. Uh, and he and I differ in, in so many basic fundamental ways. Uh, I, after Stonewall, after the first Pride, I did like most people do. I got on with my life and, uh, you know, established a profession uh, and retired, uh, continued doing gay rights work. Uh, whereas he left Stonewall and that's all he's done with his life is talk about his time at Stonewall and created a, a publication. It, it's the type that you'd probably be familiar with, a bar rag. They used to be handed out free in bars. Yeah. Now, it's an on- yes. now it's an online bar rag with, you know, all the, right. the, 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 the intellectual capacity of a weekly reader. Um, it, it's, <laughs> And High he started for children. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and he tried to lecture me, and uh, it went as you might expect. I came right back at him, and I told him he had told me not to speak about um, uh, for GLF, and I told him about that what? never happened. GLF, the Gay Liberation Front, and I said that never happened. You're leveling a charge that's untrue. Uh, but let me tell you that I will speak about GLF whenever and wherever I want and without your permission. So we're, we're still tying that one up, but uh, That's, uh, hopefully this is the this end was of a man, th- This was a man that, that, that was there at Stonewall when you were at Stonewall, you knew each other as, as, as young adults, am I right? We, we, weren't, we weren't friends or colleagues. Um, okay. he, uh, he belonged to GLF. And uh, okay. my group was the Home File Youth Movement, and uh, I was vice chair, and I worked with Craig Rodwell, who was the chair. And right. uh, uh, we had been asked to join GLF, and uh, we didn't want anything to do with it because we had been to a couple of their meetings, uh, Craig more than I, and uh, we found them to be undemocratic and decidedly misogynistic. Uh, okay. So we, we just wanted, didn't want to waste our time on that. And all these years later, all these years later, all these, you know, it, uh, well, people, you know, this Fred having been on the inside of this um, and, you know, uh, before I was, I was in my version, a generation after you, but people, I, I wonder sometimes if people outside actually know how much infighting there is and how many political and philosophical conflicts there really are in what they think of as this community. There is, you know, I'm not sure that there was ever a unified community, even when it was uncontroversially gay and lesbian, but uh, it certainly isn't now. And I guess the same, some of the same fights are still going on 50 years later, but some of us, some of the originals, I suppose, were on the, um, were on the side of the revisionists. What would you, from your vantage point now, I mean, we know all this lying is going on. I actually do want to say something uh, about the Twitter ratio. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised to see that. It's not much of a victory, but it is something of a victory. The fact that I didn't count, um, but I scrolled through the responses to Charity Clark's tweet, the Vermont Attorney General, and I scrolled through literally hundreds and not a single one that I noticed was in support of her. All of them were saying, you're making this up, you're giving out misinformation, you're lying, et cetera. Just the fact that she did get negatively ratioed, excuse me, uh, is a little bit of hope for me because a year ago, two years ago on Twitter, that never would have happened. But as you see, Fred, she has not been moved to say anything in response to this. Right, and that is the typical reaction. What can we do to get these people to actually, is there anything we can do? Will any of these people actually say, oh, I'm sorry, I was misled. I've actually spoken to some of the principals who were physically there in 1969. Um, this this information that I gave out was given to me and it was inaccurate. We can't even get that from one of them, it seems to me. Well, the... the you're not going to. Um, it's not in the nature of a politician to admit error. Uh, and uh, they, their, their grasp of history is so poor that they don't realize, as you mentioned earlier on, 
that um, this, this schism has um, occurred in the past, and not just 50 years ago. It, the, the first thing that I'm aware of of 100 years ago, the late 19th century, uh, Ms. Hirschfeld um, had all and formed the very, very first uh, gay groups in Germany. And by 1903, uh, having gotten sick of Hirschfeld's idea that, that um, uh, uh, gays constituted a third sex and that eugenicism was the, the solution for all of that, the, the, the group broke away and uh, left his organization. His is the more famous of the two, uh, or I should say infamous from their, their botched sur surgeries. But um, uh, the, the, the idea of decisionism in, in this community is, is old, and it's been ongoing for more than 120 years. That's true. That's true. It's amazing some of the um, bad actors from the past in sexology that these modern alleged queers hold up as paragons of virtue and liberation. It's, it's, it's quite disturbing to me. From your vantage point, first, Fred, can I, go. Can I yeah, just no, please, tell please you, respond. Yes. You know, the, the first surgery in Hirschfeld's Institute was performed by a doctor who later on, after uh, the Nazis had taken over, went on to become an official in the Hitler Youth. And uh, he then performed surgeries and experiments on prisoners at Dachau. So it, it gives you a, a sense of the ethical underpinnings of gender ideology, that they could so easily transfer what they were doing at one time into um, medicine at a later point. Yeah, uh, and thank you for bringing that up. That that's why we call the what they call the transitioning of children Mengele level child abuse because it quite literally is. Um, it is amazing to me that people like you, me, other uh, outspoken gay people, we are called Nazis by this crew. This crew that claims to be the oppressed, they call us Nazis when they, again, not in the millennial sense, but in the original sense, they literally have fandoms for for actual Nazi participants. <laughs> it's it's the reversal is so complete. From your vantage point, as we wrap this up, um, having been involved with this uh, at sometimes uh, more deeply than others over your life, what would you say to young gay people with their head on straight who want to make their way through this mess? What advice do you have? What approach would you suggest? Well, first, uh, as a foundational step, they need to learn the history. And you can't really, I mean, you can if you know what you're doing, but you can't really learn that history if you go online and click on the top three links. Uh, you're going to get the narrative. You'll have to go pages in before you find actual history links. Uh, people, people have sent me links in support of, of trans, the transgender narrative, and they come from uh, feature pieces from Good Housekeeping or the Washington Post, things that have no original reporting and are not fact-based. And they, they consider that to be a slam dunk, whereas I try to turn them towards looking at histories written by historians. None of the historians right. say, the trans activists say today. Do any book titles come to mind? Are there any particular good uh, readers as an introduction to the late 20th century gay liberation movement? Well, the, the one I always recommend in answer to that question is David Carter's um, The Stonewall Riots um, that, that sparked the uh, gay revolution. That's, that's the book that gets you started. And, you know, right. like everyone, David, he's got a couple of things wrong in there, but it, it's, it's a good place to start. Yeah. Books. Books are a good place to start because they can't be erased with a mouse click, which, of course, is why they don't like people reading books anymore. And they have footnotes. Yes. Yes. You can actually track the, the provenance, if you will, of the information. 
That's Fred, I want to thank you for for joining us again. Thank you for your good work. Um, it's 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 really. I wish you didn't have to do what you do, but I'm glad that you are doing it uh, because to see you out there actually pushing back under your own name, saying, you know, I'm this guy, and what these guys are saying just isn't right. I mean, we need it. Um, and thank you. And uh, let's see what the next couple of years brings. <laughs> yes. All right. Everyone, thanks, Fred. Thank you very much for joining us. Fred Sargent, one of the originals at Stonewall. Um, and we will come back and see you after the break. Can't get enough of our love, baby? That's because you're not subscribed. Move that thumb over to the great big old subscribe button on your podcast app so you never miss an episode. We put out audio only exclusive content that you won't get on any other video platform. So make sure you subscribe today. Looking for a non-woke place to put your money where your mouth is? Put it where my mouth is. Disaffected supporters get access to our private Discord chat server, backstage episode recording sessions, surprise guests, and more. And all it takes is $10 a month. You've got two options. Either Substack, visit us at disaffectedpod.substack.com, or go over to subscribestar.com slash disaffected. Remember, choose the $10 level or higher for Discord access. Welcome back. There's something I didn't get to in the last segment, so we're going to do it right now really quickly. We have tried to tell people that Marsha P. Johnson was a man named Malcolm Michaels, who did not consider himself a woman, who was a drag queen, not transgender. Nobody will believe us, so maybe they'll believe it if we hear it from Mr. Michaels himself. I was a boy, and I was in drag, and I was... I would tell them that I would go like hustling and would they want to go out? And they say, yes, I want to go out. And then when they get up in the hotel and I take off my, all my clothes and say, I can't believe it's your boy. That I know this man couldn't sleep I was a real woman, honey. I'm just a transvestite. Persistent myths about Stonewall is that Marsha threw the first cocktail glass. Marsha herself said in an interview that I did with Marsha, I didn't get there until two. I was uptown. I didn't get downtown until about two o'clock. Because when I got downtown, the place was already on fire and it was a raid already. She was a gender nonconforming person that several witnesses credit with catalyzing Stonewall. She was very butch and she was tough. And the police were being rough with her and she was really fighting back. We have four independent accounts who said that this woman's fight with the police is what tipped the scales and set it all off. She called out to the crowd, what are you doing? Why are you just standing there? Why don't you do something? Some people say that woman was Stormy DeLarvier, a lesbian who worked as a bouncer at the time. Okay, can you believe it now? Apparently some of the men in there can't quite believe it either because they keep referring to Malcolm as she. Do you see how deep this goes now? <laughs> okay, I wanna talk about politics and culture through a psychological lens, because this is the show just affected. I'm thinking about some of the big headlines this week. Joe Biden and Hunter Biden apparently getting paid off to the tune of $5 million each when Hunter Biden apparently extorted uh, a business associate under threat of using his father, the big guy. It got me thinking about something that, that viewers have said a few times. Uh, well, th th this happens with every show. Uh, every single show, no matter what the topic is, there's always there are always some people who think that you should be concentrating more on this subject matter and less on this subject matter. But a lot of people have asked, you know, wh why am I not hearing from you more about what's going on with the presidency? Why am I not hearing more about what's going on at the Department of Justice or uh, whatever it is that happens to be at the high echelons of politics this week? And we do mention these things, but it is true that we don't concentrate the, concentrate on them as much as, for example, a daily uh, news roundup show would do. Um, but I would like to make the case that we're not missing out on something so much as we're approaching the same thing from a different angle. And 
it makes me think of what people now call the Breitbart doctrine from Andrew Breitbart, the founder of Breitbart.com, the late Andrew Breitbart. He said, his quote is, politics is downstream of culture. And what he means is that it's culture that creates and drives politics, not politics that creates and drives culture. And although nothing is 100% on one side or the other, I'm with Andrew on this. I think that politics largely is downstream of culture, although, of course, they often um, circularly re, um, affect each other, as most things do. Um, we believe, I believe, Kevin believes to some degree that the way to change politics is to change culture, not the other way around. The other way around, I used to go for the other way around, which was change the law and that'll make people change their minds. And there are some instances in which that happens. Sure. Yeah. But I think a more lasting change has to come from changing minds at the cultural and emotional level. And these these culture war things, some people, thankfully not very many, but from time to time we get sort of derisive comments about, you know, you're just doing culture war stuff. And you can hear the air quotes around culture war. And what that means is light fluff, tabloid. I don't agree. I think that the stuff we talk about is the warp and woof of the psychological problems. I don't think it's the frosting on the cake. I don't think it's something that can be dispensed with. I believe culture is the vehicle by which the brainwashing occurs, by which people, normal, ordinary people of good faith and decent intelligence become convinced of absolute insanity. It is not the law that made people start to question whether there were two sexes. It was not the law that convinced people that it was not only acceptable, but actually tender and loving to cut the genitals off children, to cut the breasts off teenage girls. Law didn't do that. Culture did that. That's why we do this. Um, Yeah, I mean, I guess that's what I have to say about that. And here's an example of how this culture enables law, bad, bad law, that will enable even worse culture. I think this is the snake eating its tail here. We're going to talk about California Assembly Bill 665, AB 665. It just passed the California House, which the state pretentiously calls the California Assembly, because they can't call it the House like every other state. Yes, I know, not every other state. I think Maryland, no, New Hampshire has some of that nonsense too. Um, <laughs> the um, This bill, which will almost certainly pass the Senate and almost certainly be signed by that psychopath, Patrick Gavin Newsom, the governor, says this. I'm going to read to you from the preamble in the law. This law changes how child abuse and the treatment of children by outside of the family professionals is affected in California. So here's from the preamble. Existing law for some purposes authorizes a minor who is 12 years of age or older to consent to mental health treatment or counseling on an outpatient basis or to residential shelter services if the minor is mature enough to participate intelligently in the outpatient services as specified and, and either the minor would present a danger of serious physical or mental harm to themselves or to others, or if the minor is the alleged victim of incest or child abuse. So to recap that, California law currently allows minors up to the age of 12 who are alleged to be victims of incest victims of child abuse, and who present a serious physical harm to themselves or others uh, to, quote, consent to treatment. Back to the preamble. This bill would align the existing laws by removing the additional requirement that in order to consent to mental health treatment or counseling, the minor must present a danger of serious physical or mental harm to themselves or others, or, others, or to be the alleged victim of incest or child abuse. So they are taking that condition away. You no longer have to be a child who's who's being abused or who is in danger of being abused or hurting yourself uh, in order to be considered able to consent to treatment. So that condition is now removed if this new law passes. 
yes, you should ask yourself why. Why would they want to expand this to children who are not victims of abuse? Why would they want to do that? Back to the preamble again, existing law requires that the mental health treatment or counseling include involvement of the minor's parent or guardian, unless the professional person treating or counseling the minor determines that that involvement would be inappropriate. So that's current law. That's already bad enough. It's already bad enough that a quote professional can decide whether it is appropriate to involve the parents. Back to the preamble and what this bill will do. This bill would also align existing laws by requiring the professional person treating or counseling the minor to consult with the minor before determining whether involvement of the minor's parent or guardian would be inappropriate. So now they have to ask kiddo, the guy asked kiddo, do you think it would be appropriate or inappropriate for us to let our parents know that you would like to cut your genitals off? <laughs> In practice, what this means is the state of California already today, already has the authority to kidnap your child if a, quote, professional believes that it should happen. And every pro professional will believe it should happen, uh, especially if the children are coached to say or have been led to believe that they need to say that they are not safe at home because they have a gender identity or they are trans and their parents will hurt them or not affirm them. Uh, that's enough. That's all they need to say. So who are these professionals? What, what does California law require in a professional? Here's what current law requires. Uh, professional is defined as a mental health professional, a marriage and family therapist, a licensed educational psychologist or a clinical psychologist, the chief administrator of an agency, or a licensed professional clinical counselor. Assembly Bill 665 will add these new, quote, professionals a registered psychologist or registered psychological assistant, a psychological trainee, an associate clinical social worker, a social work intern, a clinical counselor trainee, or a board certified psychiatrist. So there you go. A trainee, an assistant, can decide all on her own and it's gonna be a lot of hers, some hymns, but mostly hers, that your child now belongs to the state of California. Welcome to the land of opportunity. Now, Barack Obama has put his sociopathic and narcissistic face in front of us again this week, talking about how upset he is that people were upset about the Titan submersible, the small craft that imploded while it was giving five or six people a tour of the wreckage of the Titanic. What did, what did Obama have to say about this? You know, he's so caring. He just cares about everybody so much. I am so disgusted by how fooled I was. Barack Obama, you know what? Donald Trump is a narcissist. Everybody can see that. He's a classic, grandiose narcissist. I don't think he's particularly dangerous because you can see him coming. He's, he's comical almost, you know, he is so vain and so insecure that he makes bad decisions based on whether he's being flattered or not. And he makes bad personnel decisions. You know, these are all uh, detractors, right? But, and I'm willing to be wrong because God knows I've been wrong on this before. I don't actually believe he's as wicked and malignant as people think he is. I think he's feckless, I think he's vain, and I think he can get himself and other people in a lot of trouble, but I don't actually think he's so wicked. I do think that about Obama. I think Obama is much more intelligent in some ways. He's certainly more smoothly spoken. He's a covert narcissist and sociopath. He's manipulative. So here, here he is being upset. This is from Fox News, quote, Former President Barack Obama called out what he perceived as a double standard in media coverage of the tragedy of the Ocean Gate Titan submersible versus the migrant boat that sank off the, that sank off the coast of Greece last week. <laughs> I didn't even hear about the migrant boat. Suck it, Obama. In an interview with CNN host Christian Amanpour in Athens, Greece, Thursday night, the 44th president railed against, quote, inequality in our democracy and claimed the fact that the news of the missing ocean gate sub dominated the news cycle while the sinking of a migrant boat in the mediterranean sea did not is an example of this inequality and here's a quote from obama 
our democracy is not going to be healthy with the levels of high levels of inequality that we've generated from globalization, automation, and the decline in unions. Obscene inequality. You think about news of the day. Generally, we're not talking about news of the day, but right now we have 24-hour coverage, and I understand it, of this submarine, this submersible that tragically right now is lost at the bottom of the sea. But, 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 but all the migrants also died and people aren't upset about that, which means they are hateful. Shut up. Do you believe this man actually has a heart, actually morally, altruistically cares about this? If you do, I can't help you. Because it isn't true. I used to believe it. I voted for him. I used to believe it. It isn't true. It's not true. Let's have an update on last week's show. Do you remember our mic drop a narcissist at commencement? We'll refresh you with the video. Okay. Let's go. Let's go. You didn't let me get my moment, so I want to say my name is Kadijata Diallo, and I'm graduated today. Hey, oh, yes. You snatched the mic out of my head, so today is going to be all about me. Oh, drop the mic. Congratulations. <laughs> gonna be all about me boom let's find out more about her this is from the new york post headline nyc college grad says viral mic drop justified because she's quote black woman in america and i am always in the right <laughs> Oh, you know, people got so mad at me the first time I said this. I think it was on the show, uh, Bad Behavior is Beautiful, when I decided to make the theme of the show about uh, what a rich social living black narcissist can make in this country right now. What a very, very good time it was in the emotional economy to be a black cluster B. Ooh, people got so mad about that. Why do I hate black people so much? <laughs> Please. I was absolutely right because of course I was. Listen to this from the story. This is her. This is Kadia Iman. Da, 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 da. She needs a sound effect. To everyone saying I should be embarrassed or I'll never get a job, I'm a black woman in America. Kadia Iman, digital content creator and what? Only fans model who apparently graduated from LaGuardia Community College last week said on social media. Next quote. I am always in the right. You will not gaslight me into thinking I'm the bad guy. I did it for girls that look like me. Love you, she said defiantly. <laughs> How much more blatant does it have to get for my fellow white people to call bullshit on narcissistic, parasitic, black trash? Don't be upset. I know, and a little emotional tug there. White guy said a really mean thing about black people. I know it hurts. It's also true. All the sins of white people are recapitulated every single day in the news media and every single day with liberals and progressives talking about it, and they are exaggerated until white people actually think of themselves as devils. That, that has happened. That's what, what do you think white guilt is? That is white guilt. I suffered from white guilt. I have nothing to do with whatever happened to black people in the past, and I have zero and jack shit to do with what happens to black people today, just like I have zero and jack shit to do with what happens to any population today, except the sphere of my own life that I can control. Not my responsibility. It's not your responsibility. It's not anybody's responsibility except the people themselves. Yes, we should live in a society where legal structural barriers are removed that unfairly prevent certain populations from getting to the goals that other populations get can get to. But we have done that. No, 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 no. That doesn't mean I'm saying that no instances of racism or classism exist anymore. I'm not saying that. But we do not, and we have not lived in a world for decades where there were legal structural barriers to this stuff. You know, every time you hear a bunch of kids, you hear about a bunch of kids rioting like they did in the Chicago Loop a few weeks ago, and the mayor of Chicago, Brandon Johnson, who is even more woke than Lori Lightfoot, who got the boot, and of course the voters replaced Lori Lightfoot with a black person even woker than Lori Lightfoot, because that makes complete sense, it being Chicago. 
talked about how these teenagers who were destroying property in the Chicago Loop shouldn't be criticized because they lack opportunities. No, they don't. What they lack is the will to fill out a job application. That's the truth. You know it's the truth. Brandon Johnson knows it's the truth. They know it's the truth. Their mamas know it's the truth. Lack of opportunities, my foot. That's abuse conditioning at work on a lot of people. White guilt works especially well on some of us because of abuse conditioning. It's the same thing that kept my mouth shut for most of my life about the obvious society-wide takeover of female-style psychological abuse tactics to effectuate political goals. I had feminist guilt. Women are always victims, right? Black people are always victims, right? Black people are always just this side of being lynched, even when they turn the corner, right? No. <laughs> We're going to end the show with a letter to Target, the corporation Target, the department store from 15 attorneys general among the various states. Recently, Target took down or moved to the back of the store its lewd pride merchandise collection, put it in the back of the bus in the back of the store where it belongs. It doesn't belong anywhere at all, but it certainly belongs in the back if it has to be there. Of course, there's no place that a baby onesie with a pride flag on it actually belongs because that's perverse. And there is no place that requires girls swimsuits with tuck a dick technology. Yes, Target had those. Yes, it's real. You know, to create a smoother appearance. For children, yeah. None of this belongs anywhere, but I'll take what I can get and I'll take it being in the back of the store. But 15 attorneys general don't think that's okay. And here are some quotes from a letter that they sent to Target this past week. As attorneys general with a strong commitment to protecting the civil rights of LGBTQIA plus individuals, we write to express our resolute and unequivocal support for the LGBTQIA plus community, as well as our concern regarding recent events in Target stores involving intimidation and destruction of certain pride related merchandise and Target's resulting decision to remove some pride merchandise from its stores. We commend, of course, Target's intention to keep its staff members and customers safe. Protecting workers from harassment, violence, threats of violence, and predation is one of the highest priorities of our offices. And we deplore any and all malicious destruction of pride merchandise and any and all intimidation of Target staff. As we see it, Target has been the victim of potentially criminal acts in response to which we encourage you to reach out to the responsible authorities. I won't give you much more, but I'll give you a little bit more because I want you to understand what this letter really is. Against this backdrop, Pride merchandise, like Target's, helps LGBTQIA plus people see that they enjoy considerable support and that loud and intimidating fringe voices and bullies do not represent the views of society at large. Here's where we really get into it. <clears throat> Which one do I want to show you first? We understand Target recently pulled some pride merchandise from his shelves out of concern for worker and customer safety. While we understand the basis for this action, we're also concerned it sends a message to those who engage in hateful and disruptive conduct and can cause even large corporations to succumb to their bullying and that they have the power to determine when LGBTQIA consumers will feel comfortable in Target stores. Though we don't doubt Target's longstanding commitment to LGBTQIA people and equality, and though we laud your intention to keep your staff members safe and your customers safe, we fear your choice to pull pride merchandise demonstrates that intentional violence and intimidation can set back the march for social progress for LGBTQIA plus equality, which as we have noted is already under attack nationwide. 
<laughs> All right, I laid it on a little bit thick. Do you get it though? This is, when in God's name did it become normal for the state, for, for attorney general, for attorneys general from the states to insert themselves into the merchandising affairs of private businesses? When did it become normal for state attorneys general to done a department store chain with the responsibility to push a socially project, pro, progressive agenda? And what do you think the real message of that letter is? Right at the end, indeed, all our states have laws protecting against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity in places of public accommodation like Target stores. While these laws certainly do not create a legal obligation for retailers to offer any particular merchandise or create any particular displays, this is where I really should have done the accent. They do demand that customers be treated equally. In this context, we urge Target to be mindful of its obligations under these laws as it makes decisions as to how to respond to backlash against pride merchandise. Awfully nice department store. Be a shame if anything happened to it.